wellnesscouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. You're listening to A Quirky Journey, the healthy family podcast with your hosts, Joe Witten and Leah Follett. Welcome to A Quirky Journey. Join us as we share our family's journeys to good health. You'll find plenty of inspiration, tips and recipe ideas as well as stories from everyday people who've struggled and overcome health problems and diet challenges in their own families. I'm Jo Witten, author of the blog and book Quirky Cooking. I'm here with my friend and co-host Leah Follett and tonight we're joined by her husband Mark Follett. Hello guys. Hi. How are you going? Hello. I'm glad to be on the show today. Oh, we're glad you could come. We're, we're interested to hear what you have to say. Well, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. <laughs> I'm not. I hear it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. But it'll be good. It'll be good to get a male perspective on things. It will be. Yes. Well, we're going to be talking about the gut again, but in more detail, and what happens once you decide to change how you eat. So um, you guys have, you know, quite a bit of expert opinions and advice on all this so we recently obviously recently started our journey with gaps and paleo kind of eating but you guys have been going for a fair while and I know from talking to Leah before that it wasn't all easy changing over for you guys and I know it's never easy when you're starting on a new diet but I'd love to hear if we can discuss your story a bit more especially you Mark. <laughs> sure. Yeah well I'll, and, I'll go first if you like. Okay. Yeah Go ahead. Yeah, so it actually seems like so long ago that I had to had to sort of cast my mind back and think, what was it like? Because it, mm. it's really just a bad memory. It's it's not something that uh, <laughs> I think about very often. <laughs> That's but, part of our marriage. But okay. it's not, anything in my marriage is not a bad memory. Come on. Oh. <laughs> it, occasionally it does come up. Now, obviously, um, you don't know me very well, but the... The thing is, I'm usually a very outgoing, very happy sort of person, very positive, optimistic sort of person. And yep. the one thing that sticks with me from the time when we did a big changeover of our gut bacteria is how depressed I felt. So oh. for probably three or four days, I was really down in the dumps, which isn't me. Yes. And um, I was just sitting around the house, and I remember it rained one day. And I got <laughs> so upset that I was almost <laughs> crying because I couldn't go outside in the sun. And I was... All right, all right, all right. Okay, so driving home from my perspective, Mark sitting in the passenger seat because he was unable to drive a car. That's how bad wow. he was. He couldn't function. It was insane. Unable to drive the car. He was bordering on tears because oh. it was rain. All he wanted to do was to go for a swim and swim his laps at the pool, but it was raining and getting through to him that you're going to get wet anyway, it's all right. Like, that would have never crossed his mind. He is not a pansy in any way, shape or form. He's not afraid of getting dirty. He he broke his toe yesterday, and he still carried on like a trooper. His foot looks terrible, but that's just the kind of man he is, and that has that is exactly what's happened in changing the gut flora over, it reduced him to an absolute mess. And I hope I never get that man back because he needs to be the stronger part of our family. I, I, yeah. don't, I don't know if anyone, um, any of your listeners have actually tried like a green detox, but I could probably liken it to one day, and this is slightly off the topic, but it's it's a good anecdote. One day yes. Leah, Leah decided that, well, she got a new green star juicer for, for Christmas and yeah. Leah decided to go crazy in juicing kale and she made this really strong <laughs> green kale juice and it was, it was like liquid chlorophyll <laughs> and we all took a shot of this liquid chlorophyll that she'd made out of the kale juice and then she turned out like that so her, her body had this massive oh, detox are you pointing the finger back on me no i'm just saying that obviously oh, if anyone's yeah. <laughs> been through a process of detox in any way shape or form they'll probably understand how mm. it felt mm. yes you, you basically feel all these sort of flu symptoms you feel down in the dumps yeah. You, you just can't function for the day. You're all sort of crying and thinking, why am I so upset? Yeah, your muscles don't work and you're yeah. lethargic and aching. Sloppy. It's the headache as well. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. For those drinkers, I would liken it to being hungover for an extended period of time. Yeah. Um, with the depression that comes with that. But, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so so that was – what kind of diet were you eating before you changed and that, what – that was when we so started So what was the gaps. difference? Okay, that from... That was when we started gaps. So we had gone gluten-free, but we had switched from 
the wheat products to all the gluten-free products with everything with the you know the rice flours, tapioca. Uh, we were using chickpea yeah. flours, and I was very proud yeah. that I was mixing my own special blend of flours and making breads or you know loaves um, out of those those types of things. Uh-huh. Um, so we were still a high starch diet, and a starch being a carbohydrate. So we were essentially still feeding that bad bacteria. And more importantly, we were still eating refined sugar. We were. Yeah. We'd go okay. through a kilo of sugar a week between oh, wow. four people. Well, wow. Because, because having the beeson flour or chickpea flour in anything, it was the only way to mask anything. And I had just yeah. gone through a period of, oh, I'm so worried about the veggies that I'm giving my kids because of their high salicylate, high glutamate. Yeah. Um, they're a high amine or a high histamine food. So I had researched those and gone down a path of, oh, my vegetables are upsetting my children. And... I started playing with these other things and, and thought they were a better option. Uh, mm. So we reduced the veggie content, increased the starches, and we made and we made it a whole heap worse than it needed to be. So yeah, yeah. And and did you go off dairy as well, or we? I mean, were yeah. you already off dairy? Yeah, we were already off dairy, and we were sucking down a litre a day of soy milk, and I was baking <laughs> in it, and we had it on our cereal. <laughs> And we were having gluten-free cereals that were different colours and it was just like Fruit Loops. But, oh, I was the best mother in the world because I was buying the, you know, the special gluten-free ones and I was being a dedicated mum and and that was my belief system and and I I, thought I was doing the right thing. Well, that's it. You were doing what you knew. My favourite gluten and dairy-free meal, because I, I was the same meal because I had this several times during the day, would be a massive bowl of... Yeah, you know, um, natural cornflakes with no preservatives added, and yep. soy milk and lots yep. of honey on the top. So that would be a regular um, yep. meal for me. That was gluten and dairy. Yeah, I remember doing the same thing. But yeah. then, when you look at it in macronutrients terms, it's honey, which is sugar, uh, mm-hmm. corn, which is a sugar, and yep. then the milk that we were having was also high in sugar. Even though it yes. was a soy milk, it was a commercially available one. And switching yep. to, even when I woke up to the fact that that's what I was doing, and I switched to an almond milk or a rice milk, they still had the sugars in them. So until yeah. we actually woke up to ourselves and learned how to read labels, yeah, we just followed blindly and just accepted that because we were putting the extra effort in, we must have been doing the right thing for our bodies and for our kids. Yes. And so you're basically, you've basically found that switching from that high sugar, high carbohydrate diet to the high fat, low carb diet, that's basically what you yeah. do now. That's where um, we're, Paleo yeah. kind of, yep. Yeah, yeah. The, so we that still have totally a lot changed. of gaps traditions. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where we're working now. And we concentrate on drawing our energy from the fats rather than from the sugars. Yeah. So I've worked out that. My I've worked out my ratio for my optimum is you know a certain amount of carbohydrates and that's based off yeah. my current weight and my energy levels that I expend during the day and and that's right for me but Mark being a male needs more protein and mm. a little bit more fat or carbohydrate as well to go with that so it's very yeah. specialised I suppose if you try and analyse it but at the end of the day if you're hungry you go and get something to eat and yeah. the, the choices that we've now got. Much better choices, yeah. As far as energy. So, Joe, what did what what sort of symptoms did you experience? Because you've just recently gone through it. Yeah. We're trying to recall yeah. what it was kind of like. I imagine it's a lot more fresh in your memory, or perhaps even yes. continuing in your memory. Well, I think, thankfully, I already was having very low grains, um, and I was already dairy free and low sugars, but obviously not as low as they should have been. So we sort of went slowly backwards with the gaps until we were doing close to the intro diet. And then when I, you know, when I had the time to be at home, we started the intro diet. And I found the first, probably the first four or five days, I had though, especially days four and five, um, I had those flu-like symptoms with the muscle aches, very tired, very fuzzy head, hungry all the time craving fruit I wanted fruit so bad um you know I wanted that sweet juiciness and, and not broth <laughs> yeah thank thank goodness for ginger tea with honey wouldn't have survived otherwise um but it was it was very difficult with around day four and five that was the main time and diarrhea headaches all of that and then after that 
only another day or so it seemed to be suddenly I had all this energy, you know, heaps more energy anyway, and the headaches were gone, the fuzziness was clearing, um, the muscle aches went, and I haven't had them since. Um, I did have one reaction a couple of weeks ago to something which I th- I'm thinking now was probably ghee, so we're not doing dairy yet. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but it was kind of like a more of a histamine reaction with asthma and sneezing and everything. But, um, yeah, that first week was the hardest, definitely. I think it would be a lot harder if you went straight from a standard Australian diet to GAPS intro. I reckon that would be a rude awakening. <laughs> yeah, definitely. With all, you know, having, if you're already having a lot of starches and carbohydrates and sugars, that would be much harder. So thankfully we didn't have, I was actually surprised that my kids didn't react really badly. Um, they only had a bit of the grumpiness and, and the muscle aches and stuff. I actually thought it would be a lot worse. I think it's important for people if they're going to try changing their diet to, to mm. understand that they're probably going to feel worse before they feel better. Oh, yes, and, and they do need to And for understand. people to understand probably why to some extent. Yes, um, definitely. So, you know, obviously the first thing is the changeover in the microbiome, all of the, all of the cells and things that are inside of your body that live in there mm. that are not part of you. They all live and breathe all the things that you live and breathe, and when you change that over, all your gut bacteria changes over, all your gut flora, and that's going to be one of the main causes of all of those flu-like symptoms because when they die off, when the bad bacteria die off, they release all the toxins and then it's basically like taking some poison in a small dose and that's where the aches and pains come from. Mm. But also some of those bacteria are energy-producing bacteria as well. Mm. So you've got a a changing of the guard happening and your energy levels drop and you're lethargic because those... You know, even though they were probably higher levels of um, pathogenic bacteria, you've still got um, a lack in your energy sources there, and coupled with that, the um, you know the in- inability to break down those those foods because you may have gut issues outside mm. of the bacteria as well. And, That's and right. Probably, Joe. The, the reason that you had a slightly easier ride to what I had is that mm-hmm. you were going. From, she was tougher. She, she was tougher. <laughs> she was tougher. Definitely. Girl power. And, and, yeah, a, good, and a good health coach to help. Oh yes, uh, of course, of course. <laughs> but for me, it was a, it, it was the changeover in the microbiome coupled with yeah. the changeover in um, changing from eating nearly primarily sugars all the time to eating fats, and I think. Yeah. Sounds like you were probably eating a mixed diet of, of which is of a reasonable quality to start with. And as you said, if you started from the standard diet that's recommended, um, the standard Australian diet, and went to something like GAPS, it'd be a huge changeover because you'd be changing the yeah. microbiome, but also changing your body over from one type of fuel source to another. So I think that would take yes. longer than a week to get to yeah. that point. Yeah, well, a few people who who were doing gaps at the same time said to me um, they were surprised at how quickly, you know, we, we were going okay quite quickly and um, some of them are sort of stuck still in the first couple of stages and they're like, oh, that's not fair. But, I mean, I did probably put gear in too quickly again. But, yeah. um, but that's the nature of gaps, isn't Thankfully, it? yeah. Like I think, you have to be yeah. flexible and you've got to keep a, a food journal and a tab of where you are and mm. no no two members in the same household have the same experience either. No, that's right. You can be totally different. Yeah. Um, I must tell you one more thing about the um, die-off stage. My husband kept telling me how dreadful I looked and did I really know what I was doing and are you sure this is a good idea? I'm like, I'm supposed to be sick right now, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. meant to look like this. But what a scary thing. Um, if, you, quite funny. if you didn't know that you were supposed to feel like that, you could definitely see that you were getting sicker and worse and worse. And by the end of that two weeks, I think some people just give up and then put yeah. that aside as that it was their failure or the diet didn't yes. work or oh, well, that's you know, a like terrib- it wasn't a, a good time for them. But really, they've got to ride it out. And it, like that duration is different for everybody. You need I to think that's the same. Yeah, you know, you'll hear people go off about, you know, going low carb, high fat and how terrible it is and and they, you know, would probably get to that stage and see someone getting to that stage and say, see, told you. <laughs> but I was, I knew that from all the other people's stories that I'd read, I knew that you pull through that and you feel really good just after that. So I'm like, 
No, you wait a couple of days. Then it was right. You know, a couple of days I had all that energy. So it was good. <laughs> good girl. Yes. And, and how are you feeling now? Like, are you probably... How, how, how much into it are you? Know, so sort of six, eight weeks into it now? Um, let's see. I think we're two months into it, yeah. Yep. First of... Uh, pretty much we started the 1st of October with the intro diet. So now we're at the end of November. And um, I'm feeling good. The kids are doing pretty well. Um you know, we, I had, like I said, I had a couple of setbacks, but mostly we're all around about stage five with a couple of things that we've taken in and out. But, um, yeah, doing pretty good, I think, for two months to stage five. It's so. One of the things that I'm really interested in is how all of this stuff we do with diet works with the way that we work in our jobs. And for me, I work in engineering and mm-hmm. I work with a lot of people that are similar to me and the way they think. And, yep. and brain function is a very important part of the job that we do. Yes. And for me, one of the real improvements, apart from the way I felt, was the improvement in my brain function and how quickly I could recall things and how mm. quickly, and sorry, probably more for how long I could concentrate at a time without running out of brain power, yeah. without having to go and grab mm-hmm. a coffee or some sort of stimulant. And you know, that, that was probably took a little longer to take that sort of effect, but it, mm-hmm. it gradually crept up on me. I started realizing that I wouldn't get to morning tea and start feeling lethargic. It's like, yes. I'm not talking about physically lethargic because I'm sitting in a chair, but I'm talking about mentally drained, you know. Yep. And yep. then I would get to lunchtime and then I would get to afternoon tea. And, and now I pretty much never have a problem where, I'm, where I've got an issue unless I'm maybe fighting off the cold or something. And I really noticed yes. the difference then. But other than that, you know, there's there's a concentration that's sustained and it's there and it's just because you're working off a good fuel source for your body and you're not having these peaks and crashes in your blood sugar yes. levels all the time. Well, that's the biggest change I've seen in my, in my life probably in my health is, you know, 10 years ago, I would have to eat breakfast the minute I got up, 6 o'clock in the morning, I would have to eat breakfast. I was starving by then, shaky. And then at 8 or 9 o'clock, I would have to eat again. And I would already be low blood sugar. Um, you know, if I went till nine or ten without eating, I would get completely like hot and shaky and headachey and angry. You know that hangry thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was like hot flushes going over me, and I felt sick. If I didn't eat, I would just like almost faint. Um, and it was constant all through the day like that, up and down, up and down, up and down. And now, like I noticed the other day I had a cooking class at someone's house and I, I was rushed all day. You know, it was one of those days where I had to get ready for that and then I had to get there and then it was three hours class and then I had to get home and make dinner. And I probably, I had a good breakfast and then I had oh, a tiny bit of something to eat as I rushed out the door for lunch, cooked for three hours and then, gone, then got home and made dinner and I thought, you know what, I stayed alert for that time. I didn't do that low blood sugar thing. My body's totally changed. It's amazing, really, just the way that your diet totally changes the way, like you're saying, the way that you can concentrate and the way that you can have that sustained energy. It's yeah, good. Definitely. Mm. It's quite freeing as yes. well because when you start moving into this type of eating where you're using your fats as your main energy source, for us in our house, it's we've got the blessing of being able to homeschool our kids and that works mm. in well with our both of our careers and, and our yeah. work. So for us, it's we've got the option of, of cooking breakfast and cooking mm-hmm. lunch and cooking dinner. And Mark yeah. and I, we have a cooked breakfast and a cooked dinner and we don't usually eat during the day, but there's always going to be leftovers for the, for the kids. Um, mm-hmm. But it's that sustainability and for us, it's, you know, like if you're not feeding an adult that extra meal in a day, it really does reduce the overall costs on, mm. on the weekly budget. Yeah, definitely. Well, We're not quite at that stage yet. <laughs> I think that also has a lot to do with not just eating fats as a fuel source, but also healing your digestive system to the point where nearly everything you're putting in your mouth is feeding your body and not just basically That's right. passing through or feeding... That's right. Yeah. Or, or yeah. So you're able to actually, extract more more nutrients out that's of the right, nutrient dense yeah. food you're putting in there. So you need less of it. Less that's often, right. Yeah. And you've still got the same sustaining capabilities that you had before. Like it's just because, a different source. Yeah. Because like when I was, like I said, ten years ago, when I was not doing very well, 
I was mostly eating bread. Yeah. It was homemade, home ground, whole meal, spelt bread or whatever, but it was still bread. (laughs) And that's what I I pretty much lived on that. And, um, you know, when you're so busy with little kids, it's easy to do. But it wasn't nourishing me and I was always hungry. Yeah. Well, I think what a lot of people don't realise about something like bread, even even the type of bread you're talking about, is that Mm. for your body to actually use what's inside of that, what it has to do in your digestive system is break that bread, the whole loaf, into glucose, which is a sugar. So you're pretty yeah. much exactly the same as if you had a teaspoon of sugar. That's yeah. what it has. Your body has to turn that bread into sugar before yeah. it can absorb it into the bloodstream. And then pretty much in a loaf of bread isn't much other nutrient other than sugar no. because there's not a lot of things that you can digest out of that. There's not, you know, B, B yeah. vitamins like there are in vegetables and. You're not going to get calcium, and like green vegetables or any of those sorts of things. No. You're not going to get anything like you get out of meat. You're just going to get basically, at the end of the day, a whole bunch sugar. of sugar in your bloodstream. Yeah, yes. So um, do you want to talk a bit about how, you know, with changing over from sugars to fats, how that changes, you know, what it feels like with... I, I just found that it was a total change for me, but a lot of people go, well, how? How does this work? So do you want to explain that a bit? Yeah, I'll, I'll try my best. Um, the the whole in a scientific way. <laughs> yeah, the, the whole the whole issue with with most of the foods that people eat, especially on the standard diet where you have to eat eight to ten serves of grains a day, um, <laughs> but a lot of people are not even eating that. They're, they're eating a lot of sugar foods and they're drinking cans of coke yeah. and eating donuts with icing and all sorts of things. Yeah, and fruit juice. Yeah, and fruit juice and all sorts mm-hmm. of high Usually sugar bars. Things. And mm-hmm. you would you would pretty much find that throughout an entire day there wouldn't be a time at which that person wasn't going through either a sugar um, high or a sugar low. Now, what I mean by that is that when you first ingest all those sugars, your body puts them in the bloodstream, and if there's too much sugar in your bloodstream, and I'm talking more than about five grams of sugar, a teaspoon in your blood, then your body's Uh going to try and reduce your blood sugar down, and what it does is it releases the insulin hormone, and that flocks it out and puts it into your fat stores and starts pushing it away into places so that it's not because it's dangerous to have high blood sugar. Everyone's mm-hmm. fairly aware of that. Yeah. But there's pretty much, and then, but what happens is when the insulin comes into your system, is it's very efficient and it takes out all the blood sugar, and then you feel crashed. So by mm-hmm. the time you've digested your food, and by the time that you've got to the point where the insulin starts responding, you start to feel hungry again, and that's where you know you get up in the morning and you're starving because yes. you've basically eaten so much sugar the night before mm. or the previous meal that you need to eat again because you feel like you're completely empty of sugar. And because insulin's in your bloodstream, because you're releasing that, you can't be putting fat stores away at the same time as you're using fats as an energy source. The two things can't operate together. So if you're constantly feeding yourself sugar and constantly using insulin to regulate the sugar in your blood, you'll never get to the point where you're using fats as an energy source and taking them off your body rather than putting them on there. And that's, I think... The chronic problem with people that, mm. that put on weight and and the alternative to that is, is as Leah said quite freeing and that is yeah. that if you can get to the point where you don't go through a day at any stage using insulin to control your blood sugar you, you have tiny uh, amounts of sugar it might be a couple of blueberries with your breakfast or something like that mm-hmm. that aren't going to spike your blood sugar yeah then you can go through the entire day using fats as an energy source and never use insulin to go through those peak and crash cycles. And what that means is your body can regulate itself and and it's quite efficient and it was originally adapted to use fats as an energy source rather than sugars. Mm. Yeah. Definitely during times of of famine or scarcity, we were then able to prolong energy over that um, duration until the next meal. Um, Mm. Mark, I remember, and I don't remember clearly, but I remember that when we were gym junkies, the best time of the day was to get up first thing in the morning and do the exercise because that was when you were going to have your optimum fat burn. Is that because you weren't, you didn't have the sugars in the bloodstream? Is that because the body could then take the fats out of the cells and put it back into your bloodstream as a source of energy? So then you were burning, is that that... That burning zone? Certainly when we were working on that at the time, that was the theory. That was the theory? But I think the problem was that we would probably go and get ourselves into that state over a period of half an hour. We'd go for a run with nothing in our system and our body might start the processes of 
taking some of the fat stores and turning them into um, the, the energy source that you need to, to do the running. But the well, problem is you probably come home and have a massive breakfast as well, soon yeah, as you... Well, yeah, I always did, you know, like, you because know. I had prolonged... And I was shaky when I got in the door. Yeah. And then I yeah. just craved... And I think I ate twice as much breakfast after that, which yeah. was usually, you know, extra bit of toast and maybe toast and cereal. And I always had yeah. a really milky, heavy coffee on top of that. Yeah. But it was just, you know, something that I just reflected on was, oh, when is the best time and how do you burn fats? Like, can yeah. you burn fats whilst you've got sugar in your bloodstream? No, it's, in, it's impossible. It's impossible. As long as the insulin is still floating around in the bloodstream and then the sugars can't, or the, the fats can't come out of their, their stores because Correct. the sugar's floating around in there because of the insulin in there. Yeah. You, you know, like, is it better then to do this sort of diet for weight loss, I suppose? Or, yeah. I mean, that's not the focus of the reason why you do dieting. Well, but, you know, like, um, when you look at someone like Jimmy Moore... Uh-huh. He's, you know, this amazing, big-hearted, beautiful man that's been doing these podcasts, and his yeah. thing has been a high-fat, low-carb, and he eats. I've I've seen him eat like on his shows. He'd have, you know, those little packets of butter. He'd go to the restaurant. He'll say, "Look, bring me more butter than you ever brought a person in your life," and he'll have <laughs> one of those little packets of butter with every bite of his meal. And it's just wow. Like, I'm, I'm what, you're like there's that much in it, and he's doing it from a weight loss health restoring mm-hmm. area and it's a bit different to what we're doing we're yep. sort of using it to maintain our body mass and because we're happy with the size we are we're you know happy being, where you are having trying mm-hmm. to utilize the healthful benefits and not overload the system with you know having to produce too much insulin throughout the day because that's an extra wear and tear on the body that you really don't need yeah well, i think one of the mistakes that people make when they decide to try and lose weight with a low carb diet is uh-huh. not increasing their fats. Now, fats, that, yeah. that, that doesn't necessarily sound like conventional wisdom because it's not, but it, it actually relates no. back to the way that we were obviously adapted to, to operate. Mm. Um, and, and Jimmy Moore is a perfect example of that. But one of the other people that we like, we, we've read the book is uh, um, John Gabriel. And uh-huh. one of the things that he says, and I think it rings true for me, that people that are overweight, are actually, their body is actually nutritionally starving. Yes. And because a lot of the food that they're eating doesn't have a high nutrition content, their body no. is, is then craving vitamins and minerals. But they only f- feel the feeling that they are hungry and they put more carbohydrate, more sugars in there. Mm. Um, so I think what you need to do is, if you, want to, if you want to lose weight, you need to feed the nutritional requirements yes. of your body. Otherwise, your body will not release the fat stores because it still thinks that it's starving. Yeah. Okay, so it doesn't matter how long you hit the treadmill, as long as you don't. And I've I've noticed this, and it's something that I cover with my coaching is is if you're not if you're not eating correctly and you haven't increased the amount of um, vegetable matter that you're consuming uh-huh. and, and those more nutrient dense foods, you're just you're not going to lose the weight because your body is doing everything to preserve your life, and it's under this false impression uh-huh. that you're in starvation mode, you're in survival yeah. mode. So it wants to hold on to everything it's yeah. got. And it's really hard. So, you know, for some people, it's trying to lose that, you know, the last five or ten kilos that they just can't move. Well, it's either because they've got the excess toxins stored in those fats or yeah. they haven't got the nutrient-dense foods to back up the weight loss that they want to go mm. through. Yeah, that makes sense. I know my body was starving. I'm on the other end of the scale. I couldn't gain weight back, mm-hmm. you know, when I was <laughs> not well. But, yeah, definitely the cells were starving and I craved all the time. Mm. So yeah. it's, it's so good to be out of that vicious circle. No, and yeah, those cravings, you know, like you eat and then you feel guilty because you're craving those things Yeah, as well. It's, it's quite and, a hard cycle and I've been there. Yeah, and I have a bit of joke with my friends. You know, they say, you know, they tease me about chocolate and how I can't have chocolate at the moment and, oh, how are you surviving and everything? Because I've, I've always liked chocolate. But do you know what? I've never, for the last few years, I haven't craved it. It's been something that you, I might have one piece, you know, after dinner or something, and it's not really a big – I don't have to have it. It's not something where I sit down and I have to eat the whole block if I start or anything like that. And I'm actually not even really missing it. I mean, I did see your chocolate mousse, and that was pretty nice looking. Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty impressed yep. with that. I think it comes I'll, back I'll to, to my impressed. little holiday with you. 
<laughs> I think I'll have to try that as soon as I can have chocolate again. But it's not <coughs> something that I feel like I have to go get chocolate right now. And it's because my cells are nourished. I don't feel like I really need anything. I'm okay. So that's well, good. One of the things that we found when we started um, changing our diet to be what I would consider quite clean in terms of eating just mm-hmm. natural foods is that we actually do get natural cravings for particular food. And quite often, we'll realise that for what it is, which is a craving for a particular nutrient that that food is high in. So one of the things for us is when we we sort of took out um, the soy milks and the dairies and all those sorts of things, we weren't Mm -hmm. having any milk. And we still don't have any milk. A lot of people say, how do you get your calcium? Well, one of the highest calcium foods um, that you can get, you can get the green leafy vegetables. It's quite good. But chia seeds are very high in calcium as well. Yeah. And one of the things we were we were absolutely hammering into the chia seeds because oh, we because were. we were obviously in a point where we were actually were craving some of the nutrients in them. But then we got to a point, and it actually happened within a week of each other, where all mm-hmm. of us started saying, "Oh, I don't really want to eat those anymore." And you just as long as you listen How to funny. those signals and say, "Well, yes. I think I've had enough of those for a while now. I'm going to, you know, stop eating them." But if, if you crave them for the right reasons. Yeah. It's not because they're full of sugar, but because they're yeah. full of a nutrient that you need. I think that's a really positive thing to start listening to. That's a good thing. Body. Yeah. It's funny you should say that because I was just saying this week, I really want chia pudding. I just want chia seeds, but I can't. I don't think I'm supposed to be having it yet, so I'm waiting. <laughs> but, yeah, that's something that I understand what you're saying. There was a lady I was talking to the other day, and she was saying when she was pregnant, she was a vegetarian, but she just craved meat. And she um, was cooking up a dinner for her family and she was cooking all these lamb chops. She had six lamb chops in the pan. She said, I sat there and ate every single one. And she said, she said I knew it was like, she said, I was disgusted myself, with myself while I was eating it, but I just had to eat them. I just could not stop myself. Uh, yeah, I still have those moments. And pregnancy yeah. is not an excuse for me. It's just like, it's in season. I'm going to eat these. And uh, like, we don't eat a lot of food. I, and I eat what's in season. But if I go to the yeah. grocery store by myself, uh, I, I will eat half a pound of blueberries. When have you ever gone to the grocery oh, that's, store? It's not too bad. The grocery store. I sometimes I go. We need toilet paper and and the other sorts of things. But oh, it's just it's just kind of a, a bit of a joke. Okay, we, so we, once a month I go to the grocery store. We we hardly wow, ever that's pretty good. Go to the grocery that's pretty store. Good. It's it's usually just whatever we can get at the markets, and it's interesting at the yeah. moment because we're going to the markets and the season here is changing, and that yeah. means that the food is changing and all the things we've been eating for the last three months are disappearing from the market yes. and all these different things are coming in. And the other day we tried a new thing we'd never had before, a sour sop, which is a yeah. bit like a custard apple. And, yeah. and we just saw it and went, well, obviously those are in season because they've got a massive box of them at the market. And they so were cheap. They were yeah. cheap. They were cheap. So, I mean, that's the biggest indicator. If it's at the Definitely. farmer's markets and you can get an absolute glut of them for next to nothing, then yeah. they must be in season. Yeah. And avocado. That's how we were raised. We moment, ate like so. that growing up. Well, ours are finally coming down and in price. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> we, our, our avocados are dollar each, so we buy about 20 or 25 oh, a week. Oh, no. Yeah. But we can only do that, that too. at this point in time. We would never do that when, you know, like because over winter yeah. they were like $8 each. There's no way we That's do right. that. No. And um, Leah and I were talking about this earlier that, you know, with my lime macadamia avocado coconut cream cheesecake, um, I made that recipe up when avocados were in season. I had limes coming out my ears. I had <laughs> macadamias that are grown locally. I could have ground up coconut and made my own coconut milk from fresh coconuts if I wasn't being lazy. But <laughs> uh, lazy or lack of okay. time? Lack of time. Okay. Um, Clarifying. Yes. Fine. Moving on. So I could have, you know, it was... It was a local in-season type food, so I went, okay, what can I make with this? And I figured out a cheesecake. And then I have people who make it, and they live down south, and it's not the right season. And they say, that cost me 30 or 50 bucks to make that. And I'm like, well, that was the wrong time of year to make that. Yeah, but I bet <laughs> it was nice. I bet it was. I bet it was really nice. It's very nice. Mm. It's probably equal to your chocolate mousse. Oh, really? <laughs> Here we are. Playing down the cards, right. I, th- I think that's a challenge. I've, it I've is. not seen you the recipe, to... but I've actually got one similar I used to make, which yeah. I haven't made for ages, which is like a key lime pie. And it sounds oh. like a very similar recipe, that it's it's coconut and avocado with macadamia nut base and, and, and lime juice. Yeah. Oh, yum. Yes. Well, we should explain, we should quickly give a few of our tips for including these kind of foods in your diet. So... 
What's some of your best tips for getting some good fats into your diet for a source of energy? Okay, so um, we have salad for breakfast. Yes. And it's always got avocado and a uh, cold-pressed oil of some sort, so an olive oil, macadamia um, style oil, so we're getting our fats in there. Um, yep. We often have the kids cry poor if they don't have a bit of bacon on their plate at breakfast yeah. every day. That's, <laughs> that's a big deal for them. Um, we're yep. also getting some egg, some fats from our eggs, and that's usually mm -hmm. breakfast. And then after the bacon comes out, I waste nothing. So all the drippings off the bacon, yep. it goes straight on top of the, the salad and straight on top of everything else that I've got on there. So, mm -hmm. you know, like we're getting fats from maybe five different sources at, at breakfast. Yeah. Yes. Um, what do we do? Well, anyone that's seen um, Leah's Facebook site, she's got a seed cracker recipe, which is quite popular. Mm. And we yes. have those quite regularly. And, and we always have the seeds themselves have good um, fats and oils in them because we cook them yeah. at low enough temperature to maintain them, the oils and yeah. fats. But also, we put coconut oil on the crackers and sometimes a tiny bit of honey. Oh, yes. And at the uh -huh. moment, the coconut oil is a liquid because it's quite warm weather. And what we're yeah. doing is we're actually putting the coconut oil all over the crackers and then putting them in the freezer. And the, the coconut oh. oil solidifies in, in and amongst the, the matrix of the yeah. cracker seeds. And they're, they're fantastic at the moment. So, um, what a great idea. So we've actually worked out we can get about eight different types of fats, because variety is important with fats, yeah. into our breakfast. You know, between all the things Lee mentioned with the, the eggs, the so bacon drippings and... And the seed crackers are kind of like your toast. Yeah. 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 I don't nice. eat them, but the, the kids still really enjoy them. Yeah, a bit of crunch is they, nice. Well, they do. They do. And they, they love their carrots and, and those things they often have. Gabriel prefers, he's five, he prefers yep. like a, more like a platter. He's, mm -hmm. he's, he is a little lazy with the knife and fork, so yep. he's <laughs> quite happy to eat whatever I put on there as long as he can pick it up and use it. Um, you know, as Kids a or, or you know, like some sort of dip thing going on. But you know, like Kids we usually that. eat everything that we're eating. Okay, so yeah. a cu couple of my my tips. Um, now, I used to cook everything, all the meats, on the barbecue on the grill. So the idea yeah. was that you would get lamb chops and you would cook them on the grill till they were kind of dry, really, really well done <laughs> and dry. But all the all the fats from them had dripped through and burnt off and Leak all that sort of thing yeah. and, you know, become a big mess on the roof of the patio. And That's right. <laughs> and look, that, that, that methodology in cooking for us has completely changed. Now, everything we cook is generally in the oven on as low a temperature as is feasible and yep. then we always keep all of the oils and the drippings from whatever meat we've mm. cooked because yep. the, the other thing is that we always buy, and I'm the one that does the meat buying, because I, I, I'm very good friends uh -huh. with our butcher and, and farmer, who's <laughs> both, um, is, is to just get the fatty cuts of meat. And they're usually quite yeah. cheap compared to the fancy they are. cuts as well. But they are. one thing that, that people often mistake a low-carb, high-fat diet is they also think it's a high-protein diet and that you have to eat mm. lots and lots of meat. And yeah. by meat, I mean the protein content of the meat. And it's not true. What you're trying yeah. to do is maintain... Um, you know, around that sort of 20% perhaps protein content in your diet that you would mm -hmm. have under the standard Australian diet. That's kind of the, the thing they've got right on that diet. Um, yeah. And you're trying to make up all your other energy needs from fats. And that's, if you don't eat butter, which a lot of people mm. use butter as that, give me more what we were talking about before. Mm. If yeah. you don't eat butter, then you've got to try and come up with some other sources of fat that don't come with protein wrapped around it. And um, mm -hmm. and for us, tallow is, is good for that. Yeah. Because Leah and I go to great lengths to get kidney fat, the suet, and yep. we turn it into tallow, and then we have jars of tallow, and yep. and that becomes something that we mix with. If we're going to cook something in the pan, that goes in first. If you're going to cook onions to start making a stir-fry, you always put yep. those sort of fats into the pans first. So yeah. just the way that we've, we're cooking things now is always about how do we get fats into the meal and how do we not let them escape. Mm -hmm. And recycling. <laughs> and and I find the flavour is so amazing. I've had kids come over that, you know, kids, our kids' friends and stuff, and they say, wow, this is so yummy because the, you're slow cooking and you, you've got the fats in there and the flavour is amazing. Um, even like if I've boiled up some pumpkin, um, you know, I'll mix in some duck fat before I serve it or whatever and 
and herb salt, and it just tastes so much better than plain. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, it does. And you don't need yeah. fancy seasonings either. So, no, I mean, you don't. For us, that's that's brilliant because, well, we don't use a lot no. of the, the seasonings. They're expensive, and, and a lot of the, the seasonings that we would like to use or, I don't know, crave or... or like the, the cayenne peppers and paprika mm-hmm. and, and those sorts of things. Like they're just then they're a sparingly used thing for well for me especially yeah. because I don't do well on on nightshade plants yeah. or, or vegetables or the, those sorts of things. So they you know give me a little bit of a histamine response and I don't feel real great on them. Mm-hmm. Um, so having flavored you know like well grown, well produced, and flavoursome meals. Yeah, it's really important. It makes it, and it's the it's the quality of the produce and that love you and attention you put into it. You know, like if you go and get a burger yeah. from McDonald's and then go and get a burger from somewhere else, at least the chef in the restaurant has put in the extra detail, and you you know that just by the presentation mm. on the plate. It's so much nicer to have a plated meal than it is to have something in a wrapper, and it's that attention to detail and that care. Yeah. And I think the love of of doing it at home just makes it yeah. all that more nourishing. Yeah. Definitely. So um, I was talking about. I was talking to a friend who's a naturopath, and she was saying when you do have something sweet, make sure that you've got the protein and the fat balance in there as well. Do you want to say anything about that? Uh, I notice that with Gabriel especially, um, if I'm going to, you know, because fruits in season, Gabriel doesn't do well mm-hmm. with uh, a high sugar thing. Gabriel's got um, some ADHD and behavioural issues and some sensory processing things going on. So I know that if I give him a whole piece of fruit and nothing else, that just spikes his energy levels and his behaviours and he gets all wriggly and he's sort of, he doesn't have a sense of control on Uh his body or the feedback mechanisms, I suppose. Um, But I know that if I make him eat half an avocado before he has that quarter of an apple or half an apple, then the behaviour doesn't seem to bite back and, and cause that trouble for him. Mark, yep. what's the reason behind that? You know, what can I extract from your head? Okay, well, the way <laughs> I see it, that what I explained before about there's only a certain amount of sugar that can be in your blood at any one time before you have an insulin response and therefore mm. a crash. Yeah. The If you eat some sugary foods with lots of other fatty foods and things that take a long time to digest, then what's going to happen is that you're going to deliver, say, say you ate, 15 grams of carbohydrate in some fruit, uh-huh. but you had it with a whole bunch of other things, then it would probably take a little while to, to get that 15 grams delivered into your bloodstream. And hopefully... Yeah. So it works like a dampening effect. works like a dampening yeah. effect so that the, it, it gets slowly released into Slows your bloodstream rather than being just dumped in there. So if, if you put yeah. sugars in your mouth, you almost instantly dump them into your bloodstream. The, the glycemic index is... Um, an index that's been derived that tells you how quickly from when you eat something it gets into your bloodstream and so yeah. a glycemic index of 100 is like pretty much instantly and a glycemic index of zero is something like coconut oil that doesn't have any effect on your blood sugar so yeah. um, something that's first of all fruit is fairly low on that if you eat the whole fruit and that's an yeah. important distinction from eating the juice oh we were talking about that today weren't we yeah. We were. I was just thinking we should mention that too. Yeah. Um, because obviously if you eat the pulp with the fruit, then that's going to slow down the yeah. digestion process and slow down the release into your bloodstream. But also if you eat it with a whole bunch of other foods as part of a meal, then the right. whole meal will be digested together and you'll slowly release those sugars out rather than just basically eating them straight away and then having the big spike and then the crash. And I actually think that yeah. the problem with Gabriel's behaviour you mentioned before is mm. not to do with the spike. It's to do with the crash and yeah. the, the cravings that come after that and the feeling that comes with a crash rather than the actual yeah. spike yeah. itself, yeah, which is fairly, fairly quick. That's true. So what that could look like in everyday language for a healthy sort of balanced diet, um, if you're going to have some apple, like you said, have a bit of avocado first or have some homemade nut butter on your apple. Hey, that's um, a good one. Yeah, that's what yeah. my mum taught us that. Um, I make a raw chocolate. Mm-hmm. which has got um, the cacao butter in it yeah, uh, and it's got the cacao powder and, you know, the tiniest amount of honey just to take that bitterness yep. out of it. And, you know, like I've usually got those in, you know, little tiny portion sizes frozen in the back of the fridge and mm-hmm. 
you know, there's so many, fat, there's so much fat in those that I'm yes. quite happy to give those to the kids. I know that chocolate is supposed to be a special occasion food, but in this house, mm-hmm. it's, you know, like it's an everyday food. If my kids yeah. wake up and they want some of my chocolate pudding, which is essentially, oh, no, I won't. Oh, yes, you can't, no, you can't, I can't tell. say because it's a secret and I'm relaunching right. and doing things, so I won't <laughs> say what's in it yet. Well, actually, no, I can because by the time this airs, it will already be out. It's fine. Okay, okay. I just had a little heart attack. I'm okay. Okay. So the secret to my my recipe is that it's got pumpkin in it. Yeah. So even though the kids are saddling up at um, breakfast and they've decided that they're having chocolate mousse, they're actually yep. having. A, uh, a a serve of vegetables, so they're getting their pumpkin, and yep. they, then they're also getting the um, the avocado in there as yeah. well. So then they've they've got you know their veggie, and then they've got a serve of fat, and then they've got the coconut oil in there as well. So that's another serve of fat, and then they've got the um, the cacao in there as well. Um, yeah. and you know like it's got so many health benefits in the cacao, and it's got resveratrol. I know that superstars, you know, can afford to have injections and capsules of this stuff, which is supposed to be the anti-aging cure to beat all cures, and it's a high antioxidant thing. Right. Uh, I'm quite happy that the kids, if they saddle up and they feel like mousse for breakfast, I'm I'm really happy yep. with that. As long as they're salad yep. with it, we can do that. <laughs> salad and mousse. <laughs> salad and mousse. What did you have for breakfast? Or like sometimes when you make some of those cakes, it's it's you know like. I've got a girlfriend who made a, you know, like a, an almond-based cake and, and her kids yeah. had cake for breakfast before they went to school and they were talking about good foods and bad foods at school. And, oh, what did you have for breakfast? Oh, I had chocolate cake. And, you know, <laughs> to everybody else, they might be thinking, oh, I can't believe that yeah. mother giving her, her children terrible, cake for terrible breakfast. Terrible, mother. But I can tell you it was, you know, a chocolate cake made on almond meal. Superfood cake. And then on like a raw cream or a fermented yeah. cream or something like that on the side. You, yeah. you know, and probably a serve of bacon. So the yeah. amount of nutrient in that, that food, um, even though it's it still appears to be quite quite junk food, yeah. it, it really isn't. Yeah, no. well, I, I think what Joe really We wanted... often have, we well, we used to often have, go, sorry. No, keep going. I was, I was going to say, what, what you probably wanted in response to that was not all the ridiculous things that you can have for breakfast that have low sugar. But where's the fun in that? I just, I love it. That's the child and the kid in me. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's, oh, I've always wanted, because I didn't grow up with those but things. I think I think what we, might be more helpful to people is to say what you actually do on a daily basis rather than something that happens once a year. Which what? is Which is you get up in the morning and have the breakfast you described, which is the fats and the salads. Yeah. Right? And then you might have four blueberries. Yeah. Right. That's kind of the amount of I'll sugar that we're talking that. about on a on a plate full mm. of food. Yeah. Or yeah. or um for me it might be have the have the big breakfast with the bacon, eggs and salad with some sauerkraut, we prefer to mention sauerkraut. Um, yeah. with the sauerkraut and then I might have a cracker with half a teaspoon of honey on it. Oh, and um yeah, yeah. my uh chocolate mousse, it actually spreads really well as a chocolate paste on crackers. Yes. I'm just mentioning that, Joe, because I know how much you can't wait to get back to that chocolate. (laughs) I'm fine. My cells are nourished. (laughs) (laughs) You're cheeky. So so I think in terms terms of total amount of sugar in a in a in a practical sense, it's we're talking maybe a teaspoon with a meal or two teaspoons at the very most, and not 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 two apples. Or I've got. I've got to tell you, one of my daughter's favourite breakfasts she's come up with while we've been on gaps. She's a crazy kid. Which she makes one's this? Is this? Ca- Cassia, Cassia, the youngest. Cassia, oh yeah, uh-huh. She, she makes scrambled eggs with lots of coconut oil. Uh-huh. And then she puts them on her plate and she drizzles a bit of honey over. So that's her favourite breakfast. Hey, have you made, I, I make for the kids, I used to do like a pancake out of, yes. out of eggs so I do scrambled eggs and then I yep. do like a really thin omelette out of them and then I'd make yep. them into a stack so it was essentially just eggs and well they do the oil. eggs and pumpkin yeah pancakes just, just pumpkin and egg yeah and cinnamon. pumpkin and egg or yeah, using so she, the, the egg as a, a wrap yeah that's right that's a good one so mm. she felt like well it's pretty close to the pumpkin and egg pancake so I might as well just have the egg <laughs> I love that she's trying. She's so good. <laughs> she loves it. Well, um, there was something else I thought of before, but I can't. Oh, the juices. We were going to mention the juices. Okay. So when you when you do have those extracted juices, how you get that great big sugar rush? So that's one thing that I did put in 
when it's said to put that in and try it with the gaps um, stage five, I think mm-hmm. it is. It says, yes. and it's or whatever stage it was to start carrot, isn't it? carrot and apple juice. So we did a bit of carrot and apple juice the other day, and it was not a pretty thing. <laughs> oh, seriously? <laughs> no, it kind of went right through me. So oh, I th- dear. and I had always I had always had that idea that I think it's better to have the juices with the pulp or in something else. And I was talking to this naturopath friend, and she said if you're going to have the juices, mix, mix you know, cook them with some gelatin and set them like a jelly and have it like that because then at least you've got that protein to help you know slow things down, like yeah. you were saying. And she's and serve it with something fatty, yeah. so don't just have the juice on its own. She said that she. That's one thing she would sort of tweak a bit with the GAPS diet is um, be careful with those juices. Yeah. So I thought that was interesting because I did have a bit of a reaction to that. Yeah, I, I think people usually think that juice is only a problem if you're talking about things like apples and oranges. But mm. in reality, um, there is a reasonable amount of sugar in things like... What was carrots. It? In, in carrots, beetroot, mm. have isomalt in them. Um, yeah. and, and those types of things. And, and capsicum. How sweet yeah, is a capsicum? Yeah, and, and they're, not, yeah. they're not an issue if you, you know, you're not going to gnaw into a whole beetroot and then, mm. and, and you're not going to eat five of them, but you would likely juice four or five carrots plus a couple yeah, of beetroots and have one glass of juice. And if you think about, okay, on you know, a whole bag of carrots before I need this, I spike my blood, but the reality with sugars, but the reality is that when you're juicing, you do go through that many carrots. Yeah. But if you would actually yeah. eat them, there's no way you would eat that many. No, that's right. So I'd rather have like a boost juice where it's all ground up together, but we can't really do that yet because we're not up to the, the raw veggies. Mm. So, um, yeah, we're sort of s- slowed down on the juices there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We well, will stick to the jellies and well, things at the moment. We, 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 we've we just... got a juicer, but the only thing we use it for is making coconut cream. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> that's the only thing we use it for. Yeah. It's yeah, a bit, a bit elaborate idea. to have such an amazing <laughs> juicer just for that one thing. And oh, even well. then, we don't, you know, like coconut cream is maybe mm, twice a week sort mm-hmm. of thing that we're using at the moment. You don't use it to make jellies, make your juice for jellies? No. Not really? No, it's for my jellies, it's um, usually just a bit of uh, lemon juice or a bit of lime or... Mm-hmm. You know, like I'll just use plain with some vanilla bean or, or that sort of stuff. Or, or some, some tea. Some tea, yes. Yeah. I was using tea, some rosehip tea. Nice. Um, and, and those sorts of things. Turkish delight. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm, so that's kind of where we're at. Well, we better finish up here because we're getting close to an hour again, as we do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. okay. We're a third person. We can blame him. <laughs> Well, yeah, add another person. You've got to add more time, see? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you guys had a couple of ideas of some good places to get some info from about eating this way. Mm-hmm. Did you want okay. to share so, those? So, obviously, if anyone's starting GAPS and wants more information, you can go to the GAPS Australia website. Um, Nora Gagoudis has got a podcast which you can listen to. Um, she's got a book which you can, read, you can um, buy from Amazon or she's got a blog as well. And it goes back to the more primal reasons and the evolutionary reasons why we're using fats as an energy source. So if anyone's really interested in the science behind that, those her her stuff is is um, quite reasonable as far as comprehension. I still I still you know have trouble in um, identifying what she's actually saying. And I read it once and I go back and read it again. And then I've, I've got it, you know, like it's it's just that you need to, don't be afraid of that. It's just language that you don't use on a day-to-day basis. But once you've got those few body parts and those few processes under your belt, as far as language, you can read and understand that. And it's just, it is just brilliant. Who else, Mark? I would say that for, oh, us, for, Mark, us, listen. for us, no, for us, for us guys, um, probably something a bit more masculine and maybe most guys probably don't want to go through the gaps process or they're yeah. feeling okay, but they just want to, go to the gym with more energy or they want to okay. um, lose a bit of fat around the middle and, and hit the gym a bit harder and get some muscles, that sort of thing. Probably, um, if you're into that sort of thing, then Rob Wolf's book is a really good starter. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's about the paleo diet and it explains in really good detail but in understandable terms about fats. And also, yeah. which something we didn't talk about today is all the different types of fats. 
yes. and, and, the, and the importance of the balance of the types of fats that you have. Yes. So you're not just Well, that'll eating... be something for another podcast. Yeah, that's a whole podcast. episode. Yeah. I'll have to write that one down. <laughs> <laughs> so Rob Wolf, my recommendation. Okay. What about Mark and... Sisson? He's got a 21-day challenge book out at the moment and it's all about uh, epigenetics and reprogramming using... A, um, a primal style diet but he still includes a bit of dairy and, and that sort of stuff in there and that's a really light easy read you could read it over the course of a weekend lots of pictures great graphics um, yeah. that would that would probably be my easy most yeah most acceptable easiest starting book I reckon what was that one called um, it is Mark Sisson and you can go to Mark's Daily Apple oh um, yes is, is the name I thought it might be him blog. yes and it's the 21 day total reset or transformation for your body i'm not sure of the exact title but if you go to his web page you can see that there and, and he's got it all on his on his blog there as well mm-hmm. and did you mention low carb down under oh yes they're touring at the moment yes they're touring. They are. jimmy moore's touring um so yeah there's a um, a local australian website and they've got um dr stephen finney on there and and some local researchers and and you you know, I most often make contact with them um, because it is kind of a new a new movement mm. um, with new research and new information and, and being local in Australia, you can get hold of them and, and send them emails and really, you know, ask them some, some probing questions. Yep. Yep, because it's a, it's a very new thought for a lot of people still. Well, it is. It's new, but yeah. it's very old. It's new, but old, yeah. Like how many millions of years old? <laughs> well, Heather, if, if, I think if you asked, most people ask their grandmother what they did with the drippings from the trays in their Exactly. Meat. They they saved them in jars, like my grandmother, and they reused My mum did that, always. Yep. 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 That's how I grew up. So, and yeah. we always wiped up the drippings out of the pan with our bread. We never wasted the drippings. We ate it. Yeah. Yep. So, so we, you, don't, you don't have to go back to no, you don't have to go back to times to find no. the conventional no. wisdom that was Just, um, using fats. Pre-margarine times. Yeah. Pre-margarine. <laughs> Do you know what? I have a I have a sad secret. Oh, when really? I was a teenager, I tried to get my mum off butter and bacon and fat, and I said, <laughs> "No, it's really bad. You've got to have margarine. Butter is bad. All that stuff's bad." And she'd argue with me about it, and she'd say. Your grandparents and their parents, we've all had it. We've all eaten it. They're healthy. They live to very old ages, like 100, you know, and yeah. it's like... And they've they, got great, great cholesterol. They haven't had dementia. They're, they've got great cholesterol. They're healthy. They're this. And I'm like, no, no, it's bad. You can't have it, you know. And my mum sort of went towards that new way of thinking eventually, and um, she got really high cholesterol. <laughs> and when she... <laughs> <laughs> don't listen to your daughter. Um, and when she, you know, I don't know what happened, but she went back to the more traditional way of eating and her cholesterol's fine again. Yeah, a lot of so, people experience that. Yeah, so it's 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 funny, you know, I apologised to her in later years and said, sorry about that, Mum. <laughs> 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 you knew better than me after all, see? You, you should always know your mum knows better. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we're definitely going to have another episode on, on fats and cholesterol and all those yeah. topics because there's a, whole, there's a whole show in that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and um, we'll you know, like you I can back. do. I'm quite confident with the the health coaching and the emotional social reasons as to why we mm. are designed or made to do things in a more practical way of explaining things. Mark, on the other hand, he has this photographic memory. So when it comes to recalling <laughs> data figures and um, information, it's what he's saying. He's rereading it in his head as he produces it. So having someone that can do that and to make up for my slight inadequacy in that area is just a blessing. I'm so happy that <laughs> yeah, someone under this roof can has it got a fully functioning brain because, you know. It's very good. Thank you, Mark, for coming in. Yeah, no problem. I enjoyed that. Yes, yeah. Because I'm shocking. I'll read something and I'll know what I think and vaguely I know why, yes. but I couldn't tell you exactly. Yes. And yes. my husband gets very, dist- you know, annoyed at me because he's like, you need to give me the facts. I'm like... Well, I can't remember exactly, but yeah, I but know you, that it's bad. You would remember or I know the, that it's the book it's from, and <laughs> oh, right. if you go and Google it, you'll know exactly where it is. But I that's think right. it's the order of importance. You need the more practical information and the hands-on yes. and the, you know, the emotional reason as to why and how. So, I just you know, need that a just, photographic memory. That just maybe, squeezes out all those you know, numbers. Mummy, maybe as I get 
you know, my fat levels higher, I'll get a really good brain like Mark. It, it certainly helps. <laughs> I'm going to go and do some brain training exercises and um, I'll see you in six months and we'll revisit this conversation. I'll see if I can retain anything after that. <laughs> that sounds like a good plan. Well, we better finish up. So thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Mark, for coming and joining us. That was very helpful. You're welcome. And I hope hope everyone enjoyed it and that you'll come and check out our website. So Leah has her website up and running now, and it's called... What is it called? Akesis Balance. So okay. A-K-E-S-I-S balance.com. Okay. And so you need to go check that out. Yep. And mine, mine is Quirky Cooking. We've got our Facebook pages as well. And... Um, also come and subscribe to our podcast that would be great on the wellness couch i don't have my notes in front of me and i can't remember exactly what to say oh, well, that's okay <laughs> can i just put it out there that if there's any men folk or any women that have any questions of our masculine nature or an athletic nature um if they want to contact mark and yeah. and want a more scientific uh reason explanation source of information from a male's perspective, even, you know, being the male in the family and how to incorporate exercise mm. and balance. Mark's actually been doing some coaching in that, that area as well. So right. if there's something that you need some guidance or help in there from a, a male perspective, mm. um, he's more than capable in doing that. Yeah. So either contact Joe or myself through our pages and we'll pass that on to him. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So, yes. Come and chat to us. Come and ask questions. We're here in lots of different places. <laughs> you'll find us. We'll put the links on the blog as well, so you'll be able to find all these different um, place, uh, sites that we've talked about as well. So thanks for joining in, everybody, and we hope you'll hear us next week. <laughs> Bye, everybody. All right. No, no. See you later. Bye. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.